Okay. So after the break, let's restart again. Uh, we are going to talk about intestinal nematodes now. And under this uh, heading are two very important intestinal nematodes. Uh, nematodes sorry, will be discussed. First is Ascaris, second is hookworm. Okay, so let's start with Ascaris. Let's know some of the important points in the beginning. The adult intestinal nematode, they live in the human gut. That's why they are called intestinal nematode. A good example is Ascaris as well as hookworm. There are two main types of life cycle, uh, both including a soil based stage. So soil plays a very important role in, in the development of larval form of these different types of nematodes. Now see here, in some cases, infection is spread by ingestion of egg. What does that mean? Okay, our food or water may be contaminated with that soil which has got egg of that particular nematode. Or in some other type of nematode, the egg hatch in the soil and they develop into the larva. Now this is a penetrating type of larva which can directly enter into the body by penetration through the skin and then can cause the infection in that person. So one, by ingestion of the egg, if it contaminates our food, food and water, and second, the infective form of the larva, which is a penetrating type of larva, it can directly enter through the skin into the body. Now first, okay, uh, first is for Ascaris, second is for hookworm. So let's uh, go into the topic proper. Ascariasis or roundworm infection, though roundworm is the common term, okay, roundworm is the common term for all type of nematode, all type, but still this roundworm is commonly used for Ascariasis. So Ascaris lumbricoids is a pale yellow worm about 20 to 35 centimeter in length. So this is a very long, 35 centimeter is quite a long worm. Okay, especially the female Ascaris worm can be quite longer. It is found worldwide, but is particularly common in poor rural communities where there is a heavy fecal contamination of the immediate environment. Now, what does that mean? So in those area where there is open field defecation, open field defecation is still uh, in a lot of rural areas of the developing world, okay? There is open field defecation. Now just think about a situation. If that child or if that adult is carrying adult ohm inside the intestine, that ohm may be passing a lot of egg. That egg will directly go into the soil now and in the soil, okay, it has some developmental stage. Now that, that egg, if it contaminates the food and water, then it can be easily okay, transmitted to another person. This is the way. The larva of Ascaris migrate through the tissue to the lung before being expectorated and swallowed. Adult worms are found in the small intestine. There is a very interesting phase during the life cycle of Ascariasis. One of the you know stages, in one of the stages, I should say, the larva migrate through the lung. Okay, it reaches the lung. Okay, then it ascends upward from the lung towards the upper part of the airway. When it reaches okay, the upper part of the airway, it would be swallowed again, swallowed back towards the esophagus and it reaches the intestine and then there it develops into the adult home. So lung is one of the important tissue during the life cycle of this Ascariasis. We'll talk about this life cycle again, I'm just giving you, you know, some important points now. The ova, they are deposited in the feces or fecal matter. They require a two to four month maturation in the soil before they are infective. So I already told you, they need certain time of, uh, for the maturation in the soil, okay? Let's move on. Now see here, look at this picture. 
Okay, you can clearly see Ascaris. This is a female Ascaris, it's quite long, and male is shorter than the female and a bit thinner also. Now, let's focus ourselves on the life cycle of Ascariasis. Now, see here, this is important one, so let me use some highlight. Now, see here, so first, this adult male as well, sorry, this is female, the longer one is female, this is a sign for female. The female and the male ohms are lying in our small intestine, okay? There, they mate, okay, or reproduce. After that, the female ohm passes lots of egg. Those eggs are passed in the fecal matter, okay? Look at the egg here. Some of those eggs are unfertilized, some are already fertilized. Now, what happens after that? It takes a few days, okay, to get matured in the soil. Now, so see here, these are the different, you know, stages of the egg, okay? This is a matured egg now. This is a mature egg in the soil, okay? That's why it is written as a infective form of this particular uh, infection. Okay, we are back online again. Now, let's pay attention. I was talking about the life cycle of Ascaris. The first one, inside the intestine, there are mature female as well as male ohms. Okay, they lay their eggs into the fishes into the fecal matter. Some of them are fertilized egg, some are unfertilized. Now what will happen? They, inside the soil, uh, they undergo into different developmental stages and ultimately it reaches to an infective form. That's I is for infective egg. Now, if this egg contaminates our food and water, then we can you know, ingest this and it will go into the, okay, where it will go now? Into the GI tract. Now, what will happen? See there, it will, the larval form, which is present inside the egg, you can see very nicely here, this is the larval form, it will come out in the small intestine. Now, it, it can penetrate that small intestine, okay? It can penetrate the wall of the small intestine and can reach the um, circulation, can reach the circulation. Now, one uh, stages of the circulation, it reaches the lung capillaries, it penetrates the lung capillaries and reaches the alveoli or inside the lung. When the person cough out, this larva will also ascend along with that sputum, ascend upwards and reaches the pharynx or oral cavity and it will be swallowed back again. It will be swallowed back into the GI tract and then it will develop into the adult worm. So this is how the life cycle of Ascaris lumbriquides would be completed. Now the same life cycle, uh, I will repeat again in the next slide. Please have a look there. Now see here. The adult worms, they live in small intestine, okay? Now, what they do, okay, they will mate and lots of eggs are passed in the fecal matter, especially by the female worm. Now, inside the soil, okay, they have certain developmental stage. They take few weeks and become infective. Now, these infective eggs are ingested by the human being because of contaminated food and water. Now, Okay. the larva would come out from that egg inside the intestine and this larva will migrate okay, through the different tissues and reaches the lung. Inside the lung, the person cough it out. So along with the sputum, the larva will also ascend upward into the upper part of the airway. When it reaches okay, near the pharynx or oral cavity, it will be swallowed back and reaches the small intestine and there it grows into the adult worm. So this is very interesting life cycle of Ascaris. Now, let's talk about uh, what type of problem this Ascariasis will give rise to. 
infection is usually asymptomatic although heavy infections are associated with nausea vomiting abdominal discomfort as well as anorexia now if the infections uh, if a few of the worms have caused infection then it may be asymptomatic okay if many worms are there then the infection would be quite heavy and during that case the child will develop nausea vomiting abdominal discomfort or pain as well as anorexia the child with round worm infestation doesn't like to eat so that child will suffer from malnutrition now these worms they can obstruct the small intestine okay now when they can obstruct the small intestine if there is a round uh, if there is a ball of round worms if too many round worms are together then they can form a ball like thing which can block the ileocecal junction that is the most common area where it is obstructed now sometimes these uh, you know live round worm they can move here and there they can even go inside the appendix okay they can go inside the appendix and now what will happen you all know if something is blocking the lumen of the appendix then acute appendicitis may occur if they go into the bile duct if they go into the bile duct then obstructive jaundice can occur and because of that they can also cause infection there which results in cholangitis suppurative cholangitis means there may be super added infection with pus forming organism as well so these are very very important manifestation so till now what i told you one is intestinal obstruction another acute appendicitis third okay obstructive jaundice and fourth cholangitis another one in case of children these infections are very common so that child develop malnutrition abdominal pain nausea and vomiting now remember one of the stages during the life cycle goes through the lung so in the lung they can cause different allergic reaction which is known as eosinophilia or pulmonary eosinophilia so inside the lung pulmonary eosinophilia may occur this uh, ascariasis is considered one of the main cause of malnutrition in the developing country now look at this picture here now what can you see in this picture see this okay uh, so a dye has been given okay this is a dye this is a gall bladder and this is a bile duct this is a bile duct if you see very carefully there is some filling defect inside the bile duct this filling defect is caused by a long worms there and in this case they have confirmed it as a round worm or ascaris lumbricoides so this eroded area okay this is some filling defect you can clearly see filling defect here so there is a long worms in the common bile duct and this is a gall bladder so we know this is a bile duct which is very near to gall bladder how to confirm the diagnosis of uh, round worm or ascariasis now to confirm the diagnosis you need to examine the stool and in the stool there should be presence of the egg okay there should be presence in the egg so ascaris egg if we see that in the stool the diagnosis will be confirmed now sometime the adult worm they come out or emerge from the mouth or from the anus and it will again gives us the diagnosis this is a even confirmatory diagnosis than the egg one now if we do barium enema study okay if we do barium enema study then there will be filling defect inside the intestine especially if they have migrated towards the colon that can be seen easily and another one if they are blocked intestine or biliary tract okay intestine or biliary tract we may need to do some surgical intervention to remove them even surgery should be done to 
treat intestinal obstruction by the ball of roundworm different cases have been reported and think about the other situation now if a worm is ascending up towards the biliary tract or biliary duct okay so and during that time if it is dead for example during that time the person has taken anti helminthic drug like alvandazol uh, that will cause the death of that uh, ohm it will be a big problem because that ohm cannot come back on its own now so we need to uh, do treatment by ercp ercp is a type of endoscopic treatment the full form of ercp anybody can tell me what is the full form of ercp endoscopic जियो let me correct the spelling okay cholangio pancreatography these are the very common question which will be asked to you okay pancreatography so endoscopic retrograde cholangio pancreatography is ercp sometimes it may be necessary to remove that dead worm or even live worm from the biliary tract now look at this picture here okay uh, you can see this is how the egg egg of ascaris lumbricoides this is the fertilized egg looks like this type of picture can be asked in these days a different clinical examination question so see there there is egg shell which is outside okay this is ovum at the center and there is albuminous layer in between now this is a unfertilized egg of ascaris lumbricoides which is quite a elongated one okay a bit elongated and it has got a slightly two openings like structure at the end so this is how we identify it this is unfertilized and the another one the rounded one is a fertilized egg now before we go into the hookworm infection what is the treatment of ascariasis anyone which drug you want to give to ascariasis uh, you know infection albendazole albendazole very good albendazole any any other apart from albendazole what else mebendazole mebendazole yes another is called pyrental pamoet okay let me let me write few of the names here these are also very important question for you okay Okay, I'm going to write it here. So first one is albendazole. The second one, mebendazole. Okay, mebendazole. The third one, okay, pyrantel. Okay, pyrantel palmoate. Pyrantel palmoate is another drug which can be used, and. even thiabendazole and those type of drugs can be tried but albendazole is considered drug of choice only one dose is enough that is 400 mg if i give uh, mebendazole it should be given for 3 days so that is the difference so after doing uh, ascaris a roundworm infection let's go on to the hookworm infection now so what are the differences uh, after i go through this you will clearly know now hookworm infections are caused by two important you know worms and the names of those worms you can clearly see her they are ankylostoma duodenal okay ankylostoma duodenal this is the one okay and necator americanus ankylostoma duodenal and necator americanus these are the two type of hookworm you have to remember this name these are the question which your teacher would definitely ask now 
they are very common in those areas with poor sanitation and hygiene and overall about 25 percent of the old populations are affected but let me say some important points here hookworm infections are prevalent in those area where people do open fieldification as well as they don't wear slippers and shoes these are two very very important points here okay open field defecation and they don't wear shoes and slippers now why how why and how hookworm infection occurs in the human being this point you need to understand first there should be presence of the egg in soil that egg should hatch into the larva and that larva should penetrate the skin from the foot so all these points are very very necessary then only the infection can occur now hookworm infection is one of the major contributing factor to anemia in the tropics now it causes iron deficiency anemia because of its blood sucking nature it go to the duodenum mainly and gets attached there and it slowly keep on sucking very small amount of blood though but if it keep on sucking and if there are lots of hookworms in the duodenum over a period of time that child or that adult will develop iron deficiency anemia now let's see how they look uh, this is the uh, female worm and this is the male okay female worm and male worms of ankylostoma duodenal now this adult worm which are about 1 cm long on average they live in the duodenum and upper part of the jejunum duodenum is the main area where they are often found in large number okay they attach there and they are present in the large number in many of the people now they can suck blood with the use of their buccal plate okay they can suck blood continuously and these adult hookworm they pass the egg okay on the fecal matter and that egg will be present on the soil now in the soil they will develop into infective form of filary form larva filary form larva this is a very important term this is the infective form of larva of the hookworm which can penetrate the skin now these filary form larva they penetrate the foot area okay and they enter into the blood stream then there is the lung and from the lung the stage of the life cycle is almost same as the ascaris so from the lung the person will expectorate them out or cough them out then there is the oral cavity they will be swallowed back again and there is the small intestine and there they will develop into the adult worm okay so this is a very important point in life cycle now uh, let's explain this again uh, from a picture form so everybody please focus here now this is important part of the lecture now let's start from here these are the adult worm which are attached to the duodenal area of our small intestine isn't it now what happens they hatch the egg okay these eggs are present in the fecal matter okay now the egg is present in the soil in the soil which is called external environment here they will undergo into different larval stages the first one is called rhabditiform larva rhabditiform larva which you can see here then the second stage of the larva is called filary form larva now rhabditiform larva is a you can you can understand like that the immature form of larva which cannot cause infection but filary form larva is the infective form of the larva which can penetrate the skin now usually if somebody is not wearing shoes or slipper okay and if they come in contact with this filary form larva on the sole the filary form larva can easily penetrate the sole and enter into the circulation okay 
now they are in the lower limb isn't it from the lower limb the venous return will go into the iliac vein then into the inferior vena cava and like that they will ultimately reach to the lung so into the lung okay they penetrate those pulmonary capillaries and enter into the alveoli from the alveoli when the patient expectorate or have cough they will ascend up towards the pharynx when they reach the oral cavity they will be swallowed back again and there is the small intestine where they will develop into the adult hookworm so this is how uh, the life cycle would be completed now one question uh, to the students who are listening properly okay now what difference you get between the life cycle of hookworm and ascaris yes who can answer this in ascaris sir uh, first uh, go to the intestine then it go to the lungs okay then again it go to the intestine directly go uh, into the circulation then to the lungs and then into the intestine okay good okay good anybody else no no there is main difference between blood and lymph because in ascaris they go in uh, lymph and there is go blood mm -hmm. yeah. sir in case of in case of this the this uh, can also be enter into the feet but the uh, ascaris cannot enter to the feet they are directly ingested by person to the, to the mouth okay okay so most of the students okay are listening very carefully so you know time and again i'll ask this type of question uh, just to make sure whether you are sleeping there whether you are uh, still present there or listening nicely okay good now let me repeat again ascaris enter into the body through contaminated food and water the egg of the ascaris we are ingesting it and then the infection occurs one of the stages of ascaris life cycle passes through the lung also okay in hookworm we do not ingest the egg remember that the egg will penetrate our skin and enter into the circulation and then one of the stages passes through the lung as well in hookworm so this is a very very important knowledge uh, from this slide let's move on now what are the clinical features of hookworm in infection now the important clinical feature many students already know but still let's revise it at the site of the entry okay at the site of the entry where this hookworm larva has penetrated there is a slight amount of inflammation occur and this is called ground itch ground itch probably there is some itching sensation okay and if we see there may be slight redness with a slight amount of inflammatory sign seen if you do cbc there may be eosinophilia especially when the stages is there inside the lung at that time eosinophilia may be seen slightly more than other time now if you uh, hookworms are there inside the duodenum and if the uh, person is well nourished then it is asymptomatic it probably doesn't give rise to any problem but if a lot of worms are there in the duodenum and if they are continuously sucking the blood okay continuously sucking the blood then definitely this person will develop iron deficiency anemia and children are most commonly affected from this problem because children think about children towards the village side or rural area they don't like to wear shoes and slipper they just run here and there they love to play like that okay and on top of that if there are open field defecation hookworm infestation is very common in this area now another important point okay the amount of blood sucked by this uh, hookworm Okay, one important data is given here. Okay, see here, 0.15 mL per ohm per day for ankylostoma duodenal and 0.3 mL per ohm per day in Nectar americanus. That shows Nectar is sucking more blood, almost double than ankylostoma duodenal, and Nectar is a bigger type of ohm than ankylostoma 
So that is a well-known fact. Another type of problem in the person, they may resemble peptic ulcer disease because duodenum is present in the epigastric area. Okay, the main part of the duodenum, especially the first part of the, is present there. The second part is present in the right hypochondrium there also. So they may resemble the symptoms of peptic ulcer disease if the heavier ohm load is there. So let me repeat again. From the entry site, there is ground itch. There is a slight amount of inflammation which may be present. See this? Ground itch, slight amount of inflammation may be present. If we do a peripheral smear, there will be eosinophilia. Okay. If light infection is there, the person may be asymptomatic. If heavy infection is there, then there may be epigastric pain, epigastric pain and nausea or vomiting almost resembles like a peptic ulcer disease. And another very, very important point is the person will have iron deficiency anemia in case of heavy hookworm infestation because that ohm can constantly suck the blood. The amount of blood sucking is 0.15 ml per ohm per day for onchalostom duodenal and 0.3 ml per ohm per day in case of Necator americanus because Necator is considered slightly bigger ohm than onchalostoma. Now, okay, I will not uh, start any other slide for today, but let me ask you one question here. How do you confirm the diagnosis of hookworm infestation? Yes. One is stool examination. Very good. Okay. Nice answer. CBC. CBC is another CBC, one. Sir. Good. Good. Neutrophil B increase. Good. Any other? Any other investigation you want to include here? Stool examination. CBC. Third one. Abdominal ultrasound. Yes. Abdominal ultrasound. Abdominal ultrasound. Okay. Probably not blood, that useful. Blood culture. Blood culture. <laughs> Blood, blood, examination of food. Okay, blood uh, culture will not reveal anything because you know this organism uh, cannot be grown in those ordinary media. Okay, anybody else? Uh, uh, site. Okay. Observing colonoscopy. Now colonoscopy. Now remember one thing: colonoscopy is also not useful here because <laughs> these 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 worms are mainly present in the duodenal area. Duodenal area. Okay. So another one you are missing. What? There is anemia. See there, there is anemia. So what type, what type of test you like to do to confirm this anemia? Yes. Iron profile. Iron deficiency. Iron, iron profile. Check. Very good. Now the answer is coming. It's called iron profile. Now if I combine all the investigation together, okay. First is a stool examination for that particular egg, okay, or ova of the parasite. Second, CBC, just to make sure whether there is anemia or not. And peripheral smear, just to make sure, okay, just to make sure what type of anemia is this. And okay, so uh, what we are talking is how to diagnose hookworm infection. So we already listed so many things. Only one thing I like to you know add here is iron profile. Now, iron profile means you check, uh, you know, uh, serum ferritin, okay, then serum iron level, and what is the total iron binding capacity? So, serum iron, serum ferritin, and total iron binding capacity. These are the part of iron profile. And this is iron deficiency anemia. So, most of the students already know serum iron will be low, okay, serum ferritin will be low but total iron binding capacity will be high. So these are very, very important point. Now, the last part is the treatment. So how we uh, do the treatment here, okay? How we do the treatment. See here, just like any other uh, helminthic infestation, so we give anti-helminthic drug like albendazole in a single 400 milligram dose or daily for three days. In heavy infection, you can use daily for three days. In a 
um, you know milder type of infestation or infection i can say a 400 mg uh, shingle dose is enough now, if i choose mevendazol i need to give 100 mg twice daily for 3 days okay? mevendazol is always given like that parental palmate also can be tried these are given in several 11 mg per kg doses usually over 3 days so this is all about the discussion on hookum infection Thank you so much.